Okay, welcome folks to this, uh, gosh, August 24th. I have to look at the date to uh, put that land in my system. And my name's Jill Davey, and uh, I'm one of the teachers here with True North Insight. So I'm glad you've dropped into this practice. Tonight um, is an introduction and the beginning of a little series. I think it'll be five. Yes, it will be five, maybe six. No, it'll probably be five sessions. And uh, so we're going to just look at these one at a time and then experience them as we go along. And what we're talking about this uh, topic, this little series of five different sessions is something called the five aggregates. The Pali word, uh, which is the language the teachings were first written down in, as far as we know. Um, so the Pali word for aggregates is called khandas, K-H-A-N. D-H-A-S, and in Sanskrit, it would be skandhas, but that's confusing, so I shouldn't have said that. <laughs> and um, so why do we, why this topic, why is this relevant or interesting? And it's more than interesting, it's extremely important, extremely important and liberating, is because of what the Buddha taught about stress and suffering. So there's a definition that's repeated very often in the written teachings of how the Buddha defined something called dukkha. Dukkha is a Pali word, D-U-K-K-H-A. And the easiest translation of that is stress, or it's often translated as suffering. But suffering is not a very helpful translation to me, it, because uh, we think of suffering as just like the really, really painful things in life. Is suffering? It's a pretty big word in in English and. Um, but this dukkha it, it is much, way, much, much broader than that and includes mm, just like discontent, like not liking, aversion, um, worry, anxiety, stress, um, all the way up to suffering and even further into despair and anguish and um and it sounds like it's it's all so negative but dukkha also includes all the beautiful joyful things in life the, and the understanding that they are impermanent and so they're not reliable sources of constant permanent happiness and joy because anything, anyone, all things are changing and impermanent. And if we think that is a source of happiness, that thing or that person or whatever, um, we can very shortly see that that is not the case because um, everything is changing and therefore unreliable source of constant happiness. So the actual, I'll give you the this definition as it comes from in the suttas, in the teachings. Uh, and it, it goes like this. Now this monks, he would be addressing a group of monastics, is the noble truth of dukkha. Birth is dukkha. Aging is dukkha. Yes. Death is dukkha. And then there's a little list here, sorrow, lamentation, pain, grief, and despair are dukkha. 
Association with the unbeloved is dukkha. Separation from the loved is dukkha. Not getting what is wanted is dukkha. And then here's the punchline. In short, the five clinging aggregates are dukkha. Okay, so I'm going to just give a little breakdown of some of these because there's a lot in there, obviously. Birth is dukkha. So sometimes people don't like this one because they're like, what? It's so joyful, so beautiful, new life coming. And, you know, yes, yes. And we know that, I mean, usually the baby's crying. Usually the mom is in a lot of pain. <laughs> there's pain in birth. We know that the, the physical form is going to experience pain for both the mom and the babe. And, um, and that's happening right from the get-go. So there, there is, even though it can be a joyful and wondrous occasion, we know that that being is going to experience it's part of this human experience that we are all experiencing dukkha. So birth is dukkha, aging is dukkha. <laughs> well, the multi-billion dollar industries trying to tell us to stop aging are certainly um, reaping the profits of that, that industry. Um, yeah, so the aging body um, starts to break down and have more illness and more aches and more pains and uh, um, and and eventually death. So death is also dukkha. And then there's the emotional aspects listed, sorrow, lamentation, pain, grief, and despair. I think we would all agree that these are suffering or dukkha. Association with the unbeloved is dukkha. So this means like what you don't like. <laughs> you're associated with it you're you're connect you're experiencing it the unbeloved what you don't want you it, there's um i know the wording is awkward but association with the unbeloved is dukkha so meaning you're experiencing close to knowing something you don't like unbeloved this is dukkha and then there's that other aspect separation from the loved is dukkha so what we do love and want and it's beautiful and pleasant and new and all of these wonderful things um eventually there will be separation from that eventually the new car gets a scratch the new beloved pottery mug is broken the uh coveted boots are stained the, you know the whatever all of it all of it all of it everything that we and the and the loved ones die and or leave or uh you know experience uh, whatever all the ways that changing happens separation happens from what is loved so this is another form of dukkha not getting what is wanted is dukkha <laughs> So what we do want and love, we are separated from. And then not getting what we want is also another form of suffering or dukkha. I probably don't have to explain that. We can relate to that. And so then the last sentence is the big punchline here that we're going to explore over these five sessions. In short, so he says all those things, all those things are dukkha, but in short, if we want to just encapsulate it, the five clinging aggregates or the five aggregates affected by clinging are dukkha. So this is why we need to explore what are these five aggregates? And that's what we're going to do. So it's traditionally translated as the five clinging aggregates, but it, it means the aggregate aggregates when they're affected by clinging when they're clung to are dukkha so what are aggregates aggregates are the khandas that uh, that i mentioned at the beginning and an aggregate is it's a it's a word khandas was used 
you know, before the time of the Buddha to refer to like a pile, um, a heap of, of a bunch of items, like um, at a, what do you call it? At, um, at a, hmm, can't think of the name of it. Mm, like a place where they have like a pile of different kinds of rocks and a pile of different kinds of sand, you know, and um, so um, they call these aggregates, like the, the building materials. Um, and so it, it means like a heap, a pile, a bundle, collections or groupings, um, often translated as aggregates, meaning all a bunch of little pieces of something put together into a heap. Yes. Okay, so then the Buddha used this word with this insight as a way to understand how this sense of me comes about. Me and mine becomes solidified, isolated, separated, a sense of continuity that is clung to as who I am. And he was able to see through this immense wisdom and practice what the elements were, what the pieces were that were happening, that happened in such fast succession. I just, it blows my mind that he was able to see this and to teach it is ex extraordinary. To see what these five, in this case, pieces are that come together to create such a solid sense of me and who I take myself to be. So the first, we'll just tonight are just talking about the first of the five, uh, which is called Rupa, R-U-P-A, and above the U is a long line, an accent. They Each of those accents probably have particular names, uh, which I should learn in Pali, but <laughs> so a long accent over the U. Um, Rupa means form. The first of these five elements is material form. Uh, and um, most often this form is understood through the elements, the four elements of earth, water, fire, and air, that all the forms are comprised of these elements in, in a simple form, very simple form. Um, all right, so the suffering arises when we identify and cling to these five aggregates, usually when they're all lumped together, but even just one of them, we can cling to one aspect of our form, like my hair, my skin, my knee, <laughs> etc. And and not seeing clearly what this form is, what any form is, not just this form. And this, and so the suffering with these, with this aggregate of form can also be ended, extinguished, relinquished when we see clearly, when we directly experience through our meditation practice and through insight. Uh, the direct experience of form instead of the concept of forms. This is a lot of words. I hope it's making sense. Um, so 
the the problem if you will is the attachment to to it mm -hmm. there's another um sutta that or a sutta means where the teachings are written down in a, and threaded together like sutras suttas sutured together threaded together into a compilation and um so th this is a definition of, of of an aggregate a form aggregate this first one that we're looking at whatever form is past future or present whether it's internal or external whether it's blatant or subtle obvious or subtle common or sublime far or near that is called a form aggregate and then whatever form past future or present internal or external blatant or subtle common or sublime far or near that is clingable that offers sustenance and is accompanied with mental fermentation that is called the form clinging aggregate so we, to hear the difference between those so they're the same until then there's it adds on saying if these are clung to if we're getting some sort of sustenance from it we're feeding ourselves from attachment to the forms um and it's accompanied by mental fermentation. <laughs> Very good description. Frothy, foamy thoughts fermenting away like a good batch of kombucha or something. Um, mental fermentation. So uh, that is called form clinging aggregate. So now we've clung to the forms. Um, there's a, a lot of a lot of the teachings are so beautifully supported the the buddha apparently was really good at offering imagery and similes and uh very evocative images to help these uh help many of the teachings awaken for us and land for us and so for this one, what we're talking about tonight, form aggregate, the first of the five aggregates, um, there's this teaching. Uh, students, practitioners, imagine that a large, um, they're, they're in this teaching, he's, they're sitting on the banks of the Ganges River. And uh, I've seen this here. I live on the Grand River in Fergus, Ontario, um, Six Nation Territory. And uh, there's a dam up this up the river that, um, depending on this season, depending on what the cottagers are putting into the lake, Lake Bellwood, et cetera, different conditions, that sometimes there's these huge globs of foam that happen like it can be really bizarre sometimes up at the dam like many feet deep of foam and so then further down river globs of foam will start floating down river or come near the, the edge of the banks so this is what's happening here at the banks of the the Ganges river 2600 years ago Monks or uh, students, uh, suppose a large glob of foam were floating down the river and a person with good eyesight were to see it, observe it and appropriately examine it. So to really look into it, you know, you might even, you know, get your hands on it and pull it apart and hold on to it and really examine it and look closely and observe what happens to it as it continues or as the wind picks it up etc if you did that you would see it would appear empty 
void without substance, right? It's just bubbles. It's just a pile of bubbles. For what substance would there be in a glob of foam? And so in the same way, a meditator, a student observes and appropriately examines any form, whether it's this glass, that tree, this self, any form that is past, future, or present, internal or external, blatant or subtle, common or sublime, far or near, and to them, seeing it, observing it, appropriately examining it, it would appear empty, void, without substance. For what substance could there be in form? That's um, from the Samyutta Nikaya 2295, if you're interested in reading the suttas. And so uh, um, you may likely know um, some of this is statistically already, but I did a little quick search because I know it, but I you know, don't know it that well. And um, so, you know, this is not scientific data, although I, these are, were reported in like Scientific America and different magazines like that. So the cells in every human body, I mean, this arm looks so solid. <laughs> I'm pretty sure it's my arm. It's me, it's mine. And, but you know, if we, I was just uh, swimming today and in the water for like 45 minutes in a chlorinated pool. And then, you know, in the shower after, it was like all oh, this skin sloughing off from being in the water that long is like, Oh, well, that's like a whole lot of cells just coming off this body. So the, this arm is already different than the arm it was when I woke up this morning. And then inside, we can look in and in and in at the tissues, at the muscles, at the all the that's flowing through the arm, all the way down to the cells. The cells in every human body are in a constant state of flux throughout our lifetime. It's obvious, you can just pull out your photo album. <laughs> it's obvious. And though, although most of the cells, almost all of the cells die and are consistently replaced, their life cycles do vary, you know, depending on the organ and the type of cell and the function. So they don't all like, sometimes you hear it said, you know, it's a whole new body every seven years, every cell has died. And it's not quite true because some, um, they're all have different spans. Um, but some of these articles are saying, so this life cycle of a cell could be as short as three days or as long as 16 years. About 330 billion cells are replaced daily. In 80 to 100 days, 30 trillion cells will have replenished. And this article called that the equivalent of a new you. So, you know, if we, if we look closely and examine which is better done through direct experience rather than through scientific literature, but it can also be helpful to be supported with these studies. We see that this seemingly solid form is like a lump of foam. It's not, it's not a consistent, separate, ongoing, um, Self that isn't in a constant state of flux. Um, and so the insight is to directly experience the this constant flux and flow and ex to directly experience this self. Um, through contact with 
the elements, with the form, not through the concept of foot, leg, knee, head, hair, but just pressure, coolness. tingling, the sensations are what we're going to practice with, rather than my foot is feeling pressure with that floor. It's just feeling where there's pressure, where there isn't pressure, where there's, where there's contact, where there's heat and coolness, etc vibration, lightness, heaviness. Okay, let's see, is there anything else here? So the, this is the, just the beginning, and then we'll build on this and relate this first aggregate to the next aggregate and continue. And we can um, start to have some insights as to what we're clinging to and how to be free from that suffering. All right. Hopefully that wasn't too heady and, um, but also it's okay if it was, <laughs> because there's always a first time to hear these things and then to hear them again and again, and most importantly, to directly experience them. So let's get ready for a practice with this First kanda of form and the possibility of freedom with it. Mm. So you can dim your lights or turn away from the computer. Oh, that's so lovely. Or an eye mask. Nice. Um, yeah. You, Feel free to lay down if you're experiencing pain. If you're sleepy, it might be helpful to have the eyes slightly open or um, or sitting upright. Taking time here as you come into your posture that feels as supportive as you need so that you can come into stillness. Stillness is an important element as it brings, can bring some settling. If you're choosing to do a walking practice, walking meditation, might not seem like stillness, but there can be an internal stillness there of Settling attention down, slowing down. Whether the eyes are slightly open or closed, inviting a sense of rest. So the eyes let go of their hunger for delight and stimulation, and the eyes just rest. Inviting the muscles of the face to let go, soften, so the eyes settle back, 
The lower jaw might feel heavier. Letting the expression rest. And as the neck muscles lengthen and relax, the shoulders slide down and back. The weight of the shoulders felt down through the elbows all the way into relaxed hands. If you feel it's supportive to you, a few slightly deeper breaths, focusing on letting go, bringing some softness to the area of the chest, the ribs, the belly. As we let the torso receive and release the breath. And as the upper body relaxes, we may begin to feel more weightedness through the hips, the pelvis, or the back body if we're laying down, or the feet if we're standing or walking. Hips, legs, feet. Grounded. Heavy. And the first element that we'll pay attention to and directly experience are the sensations of pressure, hardness, solidity, heaviness. Rigidity, so the awareness can just Load around, drawn to different areas of sensation. Or it could be in an open sphere around the whole being and just noticing these elements, these direct sensations of pressure. Hardness. Solidity. Heaviness. Internally,
the direct knowing of the earth element Less attention on the words or labels and more on just the direct sensations, experiences. And seeing how even though there's a sense of, can be a sense of solidity that there's change in those sensations. The intensity changes or there's a sense of pulsing or certainly would be changing if we were moving. A few more moments here with these sensations of earth element. And part of the earth element is also knowing its opposite or you know, the range of sensations on the continuum. So we can also know lightness or softness. And letting the attention stay with the sensations, the direct knowing in this present moment, and including awareness of the water element sensations. These can be felt as sensations of flow or pulse. Also the sensation of cohesion. Smoothness. Moisture. Dampness.
and directly experiencing these watery sensations in their flowing nature, arising and passing away. And now we'll conclude this seeing, observing, and appropriately examining the sensations of the fire element. Heat and warmth. Their opposites, coolness. This is also experienced as the sensations of vibration or tingling. And knowing in particular these sensations, their nature of constant flux, change, arising and passing. Inclining our curiosity and interest in the direct experience of the sensations of the air element. The sensations of expansion and contraction, pushing distension, rising and passing.
Knowing these sensations just as sensations, just as the bubbles in the glob of foam. These elements in their changing nature, rising and passing. With wisdom, direct knowledge, clear seeing, free of clinging, not me and mine. Just this element of form, changing, changing. Just in the time of this meditation, how many cells have changed? They're all in a constant state of flux. And in a moment, I'll ring the bowl three times. Take your time to gently transition until the end of the third sound.
perhaps a slightly deeper breath and gentle movement. Or you could continue practicing as you as you like, no problem. So if you've joined us on the uh, YouTube recording, um, uh, I'll label this as part one, and in the coming weeks we'll go through the uh, rest of these aggregates and uh, to continue to develop our our wisdom, liberating, freeing wisdom with the practice, hopefully. Thank you for joining us.